We are resuming our series called Reconnecting to the Old Testament. There is a fad among some evangelical leaders today to unhitch from the Old Testament. And their idea is, is because society finds fault with things in the Old Testament that we ought to disassociate ourselves from that portion of Scripture in order to win the favor of those out in the world. Well, the opposite is what we should be doing. Uh, We should be reconnecting to the Old Testament because we have lost some of the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ by ignoring the things that God gave us in Scripture. Uh, The entire Word of God is that which reveals Jesus. And our theme text is John 5, 39, which Jesus is speaking. And He says, search the Scriptures. And I remind you, when Jesus said, search the Scriptures, He was referring to what we now call the Old Testament. So he said, search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify (coughs) of me. Now, having an understanding of the Old Testament helps us to understand the New Testament better. Everything that Jesus did for us on the cross has more meaning when we connect with the Old Testament. Jesus died for sin. It is the Old Testament that defines what sin is and labels us all sinners so that we all need Jesus. Sin is important for salvation to have any meaning. We are saved from sin. So if sin loses its meaning, salvation loses its meaning as well. Now, in this message today, which may turn into a two-parter, in fact, I suspect it will, we're going to talk about the types of Christ. Uh, Typology is a well-established a study of Scripture, and it has to do with there are certain persons and also certain objects in the Old Testament, certain things that picture and portray uh, the, the Messiah in a beautiful and poetic way. There are parallels, as we will, to that. Uh, and so these types of Christ uh, were orchestrated by the Holy Spirit, and then God oversaw history to bring them to pass so that These scriptures are they which testify of Jesus. It's a fascinating study, and I I trust that it'll help your understanding of the Old Testament. So as we look at these types of Christ, we find that there are some who are persons whose lives parallel that of Jesus in some way, and then there will be some objects. Now the first one I want to talk about this morning is Adam. Now he's the first one to go first because he was the first person ever made. And the Bible makes this point in the New Testament in several places, comparing and contrasting Jesus with Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. Let's turn there and follow with me in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 22. The Apostle Paul is talking about the resurrection, and he mentions Adam in this part of it. And he says, But now is Christ risen from the dead, and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So here we have the contrast made between Jesus and Adam. Adam was the first one, and this man represented all of mankind, and when he sinned, all of mankind sinned in him. So he is our federal head, and we, he is the one that brought death into the world. But Jesus is contrasted with Adam, and he is referred to as the second Adam, because he came and undid what Adam did. He came and restored what Adam lost. So Jesus is the second Adam, and he brought back uh, righteousness through himself. Now let's look also at 1 Corinthians 15, verses 45 through 47. And this says it fairly clearly. And so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Now this is a comparison that Adam was given a living soul. That made him alive. It made him in the image of God. But there's a difference between being a living soul and being a quickening spirit. Quickening means enlivening, making someone else alive. So Jesus compared to Adam, yes, Adam had a spirit, but Jesus is spirit and he is a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which was spiritual, but that which is natural. In other words, earthly, human. And afterward, that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man, here it is, is the Lord from heaven. 
Now, if you ever talk to someone and they say, well, I believe in Jesus, but I don't believe he was God. Well, the Bible presents Jesus as God. Here it refers to Jesus specifically as the Lord from heaven. That's a divine title. And so Adam was earthy. Jesus is the Lord from heaven. So these two are compared one to another. Now, you and I, because we are descendants of Adam and Eve, we also are earthy. We have this thing that we are caught up in, this thing that we are encapsulated in called a body. Now, we're not a body that has a spirit. We're a spirit that dwells in a body. And when we look out these eyes, it's our spirit that's in our mind and heart that was able to look and sense and feel. We are spiritual people, but we are in the confines of this body. And the problem with our body and the problem with our brain is that we have inherited the fall of mankind. That's why the world is messed up. If you ever want to figure out why is there war, why is there crime, why are people unkind to each other, why do people do wrong things, why do people make so many dumb mistakes, why do I make so many dumb mistakes, if you've ever wondered that, it's because of the fall. The fall of man is because we're related to Adam. And so Adam put us all into a real fix. But now here's the good news. The good news is that Jesus is the second Adam, a human being who had a fleshly body, but was not part of Adam's sin. He was born of a virgin. His soul and spirit was divine. And therefore, he is different than every human being that ever was born. And that is why we worship him. He is God in the flesh. And so he is referred to here as the second Adam, the one who took away the sins of the world. Now I'm going to talk about another one. His name is Melchizedek. Now, I've never met anyone who named their child Melchizedek. Uh, You know, I'm from the South, and I've I've heard some very unusual names. Uh, There's all kind of names that people, I think, some just made them up. Uh, Or somebody, maybe they named them after a deceased uncle, and they spelled it wrong. There's all kinds of names. I've never heard anybody named Melchizedek. I think maybe some people, they're named Mel for short. If you were to look into it, perhaps their name was Melchizedek. Probably not. But here we have Melchizedek, and we find this in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 15. And we've got a large passage of Scripture I'm going to read here, uh, verses 15 through 27, because in this very theological book, the book of Hebrews, we have this individual presented to us as a type of Christ. And just as Jesus is presented in, in the life of Adam as the second Adam, we find here that Jesus is, is pictured as a priest like this man was a priest. Now, let's read it, and then we'll try to uh, make some exp- explanations about this, okay? In, in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 15, And it is yet far more evident, for that after the sim- similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. For he testifieth, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now that's an Old Testament quote in the Psalms referring to Messiah, that he is a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, this certain man that was a priest. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law, listen, the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing of a better hope did by the which we draw nigh unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, for these priests were made without an oath, but this, was, uh, but this was an oath by him who said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament, or a better covenant as we would say. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Now what he's saying, there were many priests in the Old Testament. There were many priests in the scriptures, but they were temporary. They died. So this is a different kind of priest. He doesn't die. All right. But this man, because he continueth forever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for him. Now, I just want to stop right there and make make a motion. There may have been times when a certain sinner was dealing with a certain priest, and he said, priest, would you pray for me about my sins? Would you help me to get right with God? Would you help me make an atonement to God? And then that priest would die. 
And he would say, well, what can I do now? I don't have a priest. And he would have to wait till a new priest comes and go through the whole process all over again to get satisfaction of his heart. And what he's saying here is Jesus never dies. You never have to worry about whether or not he's going to be available or whether or not he's going to be here. He's always here. And he always lives to make intercession for you. For such a high priest became us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Now that's a greater priest than anyone else who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer us, offer up sacrifice first for their own sins. Now let's stop right there and mention this. Aaron, the priest, before he could represent you, he had to represent himself and go to the Lord and offer a sacrifice for his own sins because he was a sinner like anyone else. He was not perfect. He was not righteous. So he would offer a sacrifice for himself and then he would offer a sacrifice for you. But Jesus did not need to offer a sacrifice for himself because he was the sacrifice and he did it once. And so here it mentions, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up a sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. Now here is the the, the way to understand this. In the Old Testament, Abraham went on a battle because he had to rescue his nephew Lot. And God blessed him and he said, go and rescue Lot, his nephew. So he went. And when he did, he he was able to defeat the enemies and he took the spoils and he was coming back. Well, when you come back from a successful uh, military engagement that was blessed by the Lord, you want to worship the Lord and say thank you. And part of that was to give tithes. So he came to this man who lived in the town of Salem, now Jerusalem, and his name was Melchizedek. And he was the priest, the priest of the Most High God. And Abraham, the man who God called that through his line would come Christ, worshipped in that place and he gave tithes to Melchizedek. In other words, Melchizedek was his priest and he recognized that. Now in other places in the book of Hebrews, the, the point is made that in Abraham was the potentiality of Aaron and all the other priests, and that they and Abraham also gave tithes to him. It's, 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 it's a concept that is mentioned, and it, so it lifts Melchizedek to a pretty high point. He is pre-law, pre-Moses, and he was God's priest. And the, the, the connection is made between these two individuals. Now the priesthood of Messiah predates the priesthood of Aaron. That's the point that is being made here. Jesus' priesthood is not from the Mosaic law. Now, do you remember what tribe Jesus was from? Any Bible scholars here remember that? Judah. Okay, there's nothing in the Bible about anybody from Judah being a priest. The tribe that produced the priest was the tribe of Levi. So Jesus was not a priest if he was from the tribe of Judah. Judah produced kings, but not priests. So how could Jesus be a priest? In fact, to be the ultimate priest. Well, his his priesthood is after the order of Melchizedek. It supersedes and precedes and is higher than the priesthood of Aaron. Now, this is a theological point that is made not only for the Jewish nation, but for you and I to understand something. We have a priest. He is one person. He is Jesus Christ. He forever lives. He's on the right hand of the Father. He has your best interest at heart. And He is there making intercession for you. And He is for you and not against you. He is your friend and not your foe. And we can always come to Him humbly with grace and repentance and a contrite heart. And we will receive grace from God. He is the highest priest of all. Uh, The word Christ is an interesting word. Uh, It it is the uh, Greek equivalent of the word Messiah or Hamasia that is in the old Hebrew. So you had Hamasia, you had Christos. Both of them mean the same thing. And here's what it means. The anointed. The anointed. Now what does the anointed mean? It means one who had had holy oil put upon him. Now there were three offices in the Old Testament where, where people received an anointing. Okay. One was a prophet. If you were a prophet Another prophet would anoint you with oil and recognize your prophetic gift, and you would be anointed to be a prophet. Okay, another one was a priest. When a priest was established as a priest, they would go through a ceremony and they would anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and he would be a priest. And the other was a king. When a king was established on his throne, they would anoint him. 
And David talked about his anointing. You remember that teenage boy? He, uh, that, that is, Samuel showed up and he said, uh, okay, the, the sons of Jesse, bring them one by one. And each one of these sons came and uh, Samuel said, he's not the one. He's not the one. He's not the one. And they went through all these sons of Jesse. And he says, don't you have any other sons? And they said, well, we've got David. He's, he's keeping the sheep somewhere. They didn't even bring him. He was still just a teenager, just a stripling, just a, basically a kid. And, and Samuel said, I'm not going to rest until you bring him. And so they brought David. And Samuel, he's the one. He's just a boy, probably 14, 15 years old, somewhere around there. And here's what he did. They had this horn, and they would put oil in it and have a stopper in the end of it. Kind of like the old-fashioned musketeers would keep their powder in. It was like that. And he'd pull that stopper, and he'd pour it on his head. And it would go down his head, down his face, and down his clothes. And David never forgot that. He never forgot it. There was a feeling of it and a smell of it and, and, and a certain sensation. And he talked about it several times in his writings. It was an experience that changed his life. Well, let me tell you, there was a man who was either a prophet or he was a king or he was a priest. But Jesus was prophet, priest, and king. He is the triple anointed one and the only one. Therefore, he gets the name. He's the Christ. He is the anointed. And one of those uh, offices that he performs, and I think the one that we need uh, so desperately, is, is his priesthood. We need him to represent us. We need him to care for us and, and to represent us to God. And so he is our great high priest. There was a lady in England many years ago, back when the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church were bickering and fighting and going through all this hard times. And at this time, the Catholic Church was kind of picking on the Protestants. This happened a lot. And this lady was a Baptist, and she believed that Jesus is a great high priest. But there was this Catholic priest who was always trying to convert her to come to be a Catholic and, and trying to impose that on her. And uh, so when she was on her deathbed, he went to her and he says, this, uh, before you die, I want to make one more attempt uh, so that I can come. I want to be your priest, and I want to atone. I want to make a reconciliation for you so you can be able to go to heaven. And she said, show me your hands. And so he showed her his hands, and she says, you're not my priest. My priest has nail scars in his hands. I love Baptists, don't you? And this woman died in the hands of Jesus, knowing that that's her great high priest. Listen, uh, you don't need to go to some human being and confess your sins. He's got sins too. You take them to Jesus. Amen? You may confess to a friend or somebody that can help you. That's okay. But listen, nobody's going to absolve you of your sins. Uh, only Jesus can do that. Uh, he is the one. Now I want to bring our attention to one that is it's just a short mention, but I think a good one. Jonah. Now, how is Jonah a type of Christ? And why is he a type of Christ? Well, Jesus drew this one himself uh, in Matthew chapter 12 and verse 40. For as Jonas was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, Jesus was foretelling his death, burial, and resurrection, as we just talked about last week. But he used the illustration just like Jonah. Now let's ask ourselves, what happened to Jonah? Well, what happened to Jonah is he was swallowed by a whale. Now, do you believe that? Well, great fish, whale, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it because the Bible says he was swallowed by a great fish or a whale, if you will. And, and so well, you believe that stuff? I say, yeah. I'll tell you what, if the Bible said that Jonah swallowed the whale, I'd believe that too. Because the Bible can't lie. That would have been an interesting uh, flannel graph picture, wouldn't it? Uh, I remember seeing flannel graph. There was a picture of this whale and, and inside him was Jonah. And you know what Jonah was doing inside the whale? What you and I would do if we were swallowed by a whale too. He was praying to God, get me out of here. You know, I remember that picture. Well, it would have been interesting if flannel graph, if Jonah swallowed the whale, we'd have had Jonah here with a belly out like that. And the whale would have been him. It would have been a different picture altogether. But no, I don't have any trouble believing that God can make a fish that can swallow a man. God made the earth out of nothing. And God does miracles all the time. If you have trouble with a miracle working God, why even talk about God at all? 
So he was swallowed by the whale, and he was inside him for three days and three nights. And he prayed, Lord. I mean, he repented. He got right with God. Listen, this, this preacher didn't want to obey God before. But after three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, he wanted to get out and preach. Uh, and so, but here's the point that Jesus was making. He was three days and three nights in the heart or in the belly of that whale inside there. I'm going to be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Now, that's a mysterious thing to say. Something makes me think there was more going on in those three days and three nights than just a dead body laying in a sepulcher that's basically above the earth. Think about it. Everywhere in the Bible where it talks about the place of the dead, the place the dead go, Sheol, hell, whatever you want to call it, it talks down, down. And so somewhere in the spiritual dimension, in the heart of the earth, is where Jesus went after his spirit left his body and they put his body in the tomb and he went and led captivity captive and preached deliverance to the captives. What he did is he went and cleaned the place out and took all those souls that had been trusting him up to heaven to be with him. I believe he did something in those three days and three nights. But Jesus is saying Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly inside. He wasn't attached to the whale. He wasn't on the whale's uh, eye or on the whale's tail. He was inside the belly of the whale. I'm going to be inside the heart of the earth. I believe Jesus meant that. And so Jonah is a type of Christ in that he pictures the three days that, that preceded the resurrection. And now I want to draw your attention to the most prominent and I believe the most powerful and, and most impressive of the types of Jesus, the persons in the Old Testament, and that is the life of Joseph. There are many, there are, there are dozens of similarities and parallels of Joseph being a type of Christ. Uh, it is interesting in the sense that Joseph had similarities in his life with Jesus. And I've got a list of them. Uh, they, these are just 31. There are more, but I put out the most salient uh, j- just to make the point. Okay, first of all, both were a firstborn of their mothers, all right? Both are shepherds, see? Jesus said, I am the great shepherd. Both are the most loved of their fathers. Both were prophesied to be rulers. Both Joseph's and Jesus' brothers were jealous of them and did not believe him. That happened. Joseph was sent by his father to his brothers. Jesus was sent by his father to his brother Israelites. Both were stripped of their coats. Both of their coats were dipped in blood. Both were sold. One of the twelve, by one of the twelve named Judah. And J- Judah is the, the Greek word for Judas. Judas is the Greek word for Judah, rather. So Judah sold him and Judah sold Jesus. Reuben wanted to rescue Joseph. Pilate wanted to rescue Jesus. You remember when Reuben came and found that Joseph was in this pit, he tried to deliver him. Well, Pilate tried to deliver Jesus. Joseph was sold as a slave to Egypt. Jesus was betrayed for the price of a slave. Both went to Egypt. Both were bound. Both were falsely accused and punished. Both were with two others. Now, this is interesting. Both were with two others condemned to die one of which was pardoned and given life, and one of them was not. Jesus with the two thieves on the cross, and Joseph with the two fellow prisoners in the the prison. Both declared what was needed to save life. God's Spirit indwelt them both. The king of Egypt exalted Joseph out of slavery to be ruler over all, to bring all under the king's rule. Jesus is exalted to bring all under God's rule. All knees in that time bowed to Joseph. All knees will bow to Jesus. Both were given a Gentile bride by the king. Joseph took a bride out of Egypt, a Gentile bride. Jesus' bride is the church, a Gentile bride. And we were given to Christ as his bride. Both were given a Gentile bride. Troubled times came during their rule. Seven years of tribulation in the time of Joseph and seven years of tribulation will come under the reign of Jesus. The king of Egypt appointed Joseph to be the sole source of life for all. God appointed Jesus to be our sole source of eternal life. Joseph was 30 years old when he started working for Pharaoh. Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry. Joseph's brothers did not recognize him. 
Jesus' own people, including his brothers, initially did not either. Joseph was revealed to his brothers at their second coming. Jesus is going to be revealed to Israel at his second coming. Both offer forgiveness to those who sought to destroy him. The evil Joseph's brothers intended for God, or intended, God meant for good to save them. The same is true for the evil of Jesus' own people intended to him. In other words, God orchestrated the evil things designed against Joseph and against Jesus to bring about the good. Joseph's brothers shared Pharaoh's favor because of Joseph, not themselves. And we share God's favor because of Jesus, not because we are worthy. Both saved others. Here's another interesting one. Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, came through his Gentile wife and are yet given full tribe status in the nation of Israel. The Gentiles who believed in the gospel are considered full members of God's people and joint heirs with Abraham. While only Jesus was truly sinless, Joseph is one of the few people significantly written about in the Bible of which no sins are mentioned. And so we see Joseph as a type of Christ, someone whose life pictures Jesus. Now we come to this point, we come to this understanding about Jesus and about the types. As we said before, Jesus co-authored the Old Testament scriptures with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. Jesus himself is 100% complicit with all the narratives, all the writings, all the prophecies, all the foretellings of the Old Testament. And he is part of what in history uh, was orchestrated by his spirit to do that. And so when Jesus said, search the scriptures, for they testify of me, Jesus is pointing to a gold mine of spiritual grace. And he's saying, you'll find it there in the Old Testament. So why should we unhitch from that? Why should we ignore it? Why should we just say, well, that's Old Testament. We don't understand that. Here, here's the wonderful part of the Word of God. It is one book. It is made up of 66 books, but they all agree together, written by different authors at different times. But the theme is the same. And you're not into the book of Genesis very long before you find the theme of the blood of a lamb. And you're going through the book of Revelation, you find the blood of the lamb. And here's the understanding that we have of this. Everything in the Bible points to one thing, that sin is dark, it is awful, it is condemning, it, it is a, a sickness, it is something that needs to be addressed. And Jesus Christ came down, God in the flesh, to take the penalty upon himself and pay the debt in full so that we could receive him and be saved. The Bible is about our salvation. Now here's the problem I have with some preachers and some theologians who are stripping the Bible of its power. And some are even say this whole thing about a blood atonement is, is so old and outdated and, and we shouldn't talk about blood and we shouldn't talk about atonement. Uh, we shouldn't even talk about sin. Uh, and they're, they're trying to minimize that. Here's, here's my understanding of this. If we don't have something called sin and guilt and condemnation, there was no reason for Jesus to go to the cross. It was just an act of foolishness. There was no reason for him to say what he said and do what he did. Listen, if there is no sin, if there is no guilt, if there is no condemnation, if there is no threat of hell, then Jesus' life was a complete waste. If all he had to say was some nice things that are nice, but it doesn't address eternity, it doesn't address our soul, it doesn't address what will go, then we have no reason to trust him other than to say he said some interesting things. Now here's my plea. We need to take a stand in the church today in these times to say the entire Bible from Genesis to Revelation is the Word of God. Every part of it, every chapter, uh, every phrase is God's Word. And when rightly divided, we understand it to be the Word of God. Yes, there are some things that we have trouble understanding. 
Yes, there are some things that may be written for us, but not necessarily to us. There are some things that have to do with the children of Israel uh, as a nation and not necessarily to the church made up of Gentiles as well. But we understand that the laws of God and the understanding of God and what God believes to be right and wrong does not change because society changes. Do you realize we're living in a time right now, the time in which you and I are living, where there are serious sociologists who are trying to make the case that pedophilia may not be all that bad. I'm not making that up. There are those in college campuses who are actively, openly teaching this, that we ought not to be condemnatory. We ought not to look at it as something terribly wrong. Some people are just wired that way and we ought to be more understanding. I'm not understanding. I'm not understanding. Jesus said about these little ones. He said, if someone would offend one of these little ones, it would be better that a millstone be hung around his neck and he'd be thrown into the sea. Jesus loved the little children and he blessed them and he said, let them come to me. But we have a society that does not want the little ones to come to Jesus. They want the little ones to come to some other ideology, some other thing. And most of what they're trying to do is confuse them and get them all mixed up about who they even are. We are living in tough times today. And listen, we're not going to be able to just uh, uh, to resist this and defend the truths of the gospel with just the New Testament. We're going to have to have the Old Testament too. But between the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have all that is necessary for us to know the mind and heart of God and what is right and what is wrong. We need to have a, 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 a theology that helps people go from darkness to light. But if we no longer say darkness is darkness, how do they know what is light? Christianity has to be, listen, Christianity today has to be more than isn't Jesus cool? When he was here, there were people who loved him and accepted him. But society in general did not think Jesus was cool. They hated him, and they cried out, crucify him. And his leaders called him a deceiver. They called him all kinds of names. No, Jesus wasn't cool. Not in the sense that we use the term today. He wasn't cool. He was counter-revolutionary. He is far above cool. He is the standard of righteousness. There's one thing we understand. Cool just means what society thinks is hip and, and faddish right now. That can change in no time flat. And we've seen some changes, have we not? We have seen some changes in the world, but I'm afraid we have seen some changes in the church. We have seen some changes among God's people. We need to get back to what is right and what is wrong. And here's the thing. When we go to the Lord and we ask him to forgive us of our sins, we need to understand that they're sins. And God loves sinners. He loves sinners. Jesus came to die for sinners. God so loved the world. And I'm going to change it just a bit, and it's just as true. God so loved sinners like you and me. God so loved sinners that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. God sent his son to sinners like you and like me. Now, these types of Christ, and we'll get into some more next week, there's some objects, some wonderful, fascinating things about Jesus and how he was typified in the Old Testament. But what it shows us is the harmony between the type and the antitype, the picture and the fulfillment, the lesson and the reality. This is one book. We cannot unhitch from the Old Testament. We must reconnect to it and put it in harmony with the new and we'll have the entire Word of God. Dear Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We thank you for your Word, your Scriptures that teach us and help us to grow. Lord, I pray that we would be sound in doctrine. Lord, that we would be so much quicker to look at ourselves for improvement than to condemn others. But Lord, that being said, that we would not tolerate that which the world tolerates, that we would not call righteous what you call sin, And that we would not say it's good if you say it's bad. Oh, Father, I pray that you'd help us to listen and to learn and to grow. 
For it's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.